Now I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 15. This is a familiar story to many of y'all, but it's certainly an appropriate story uh, for Father's Day. The title of the message is The Loving Father. And I want to just begin by reading a couple of verses in Luke 15, and we're going to stay there throughout this message. And the first two verses I want to read is verses 11 and 12, because it introduces us to this parable. Here's what it says. It says, then he said, and he is Jesus, by the way. Jesus is actually in a group of tax collectors and Pharisees and just people have gathered around and he's telling them some parables. And, and it says, then he said, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. So we see this father and his two sons. And it, it's a story of two opposing brothers. One brother thinks he's no good. The other brother thinks he's too good. And they're so opposite of each other that when you look at this story as it's written, they're on the opposite ends of the story. One's at the beginning of the story. And one's at the end of the story. They're at the two ends of the spectrum, literally, in the story. But this is also a story of a loving father. More than the story about the opposing brothers is the importance of the real story of the person in the middle, the father. And we're going to look at him in just a few moments, but I want to begin by looking first at his two sons. And the first son, I, I just have to label him the bad son. The bad son. And we read again, starting in verse 11, it says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Was he a bad son? Yes, he was a bad son. You know what prodigal means? It means spending money or resources freely and recklessly. Prodigal means wastefully extravagant. And that's what he was. He was a bad son. He was wasting everything that his father gave him. And then we look at verse 14. It says, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So I would ask you this, was he a worthless son? Well, yes, he was. He was, he, no one found value in him. No one, it, he, it says that no one would give him anything. He was absolutely worthless. You know why he was worthless? Because he was lost. That's why he was worthless, because he was lost. He was the, the prodigal. You know, this is the third parable in this chapter. As, as Jesus is with these tax collectors and these Pharisees and these people that have gathered around, this is the third story of things lost. He started out with two stories prior to this, and so Jesus is talking about things that are lost. And in each parable, the value of the lost item becomes greater. In the first story, he speaks of a shepherd that had 100 sheep and one sheep was lost. Well, the value of that sheep to the shepherd was really only 1% of his, of his sheep, right? One out of 100, 1%. But yet, because the sheep was lost, what did the shepherd do? He left the 99 and went looking for that 1%, that one lost sheep. And then we see in the second story, there's a woman that has 10 coins. And in her house, she loses one of the coins. Now the value has gone up. That coin represents 
The sheep was 1%. Now the coin is 10%. It's even more valuable. But just like the sheep, it's of no value. It's worthless because it's lost. You can't spend a lost coin. And so the coin was lost. And what happened? The woman got a lamp and it said she went through the whole house searching until she found that coin. And then we come to the third parable. And the third parable is about only one of two sons. Now that's the greatest value yet. Just one of two. But the lost son is of no value. Why? Because he's lost. I wonder how many people today are of no value to the Savior because they're lost. And just like that shepherd searching for that sheep, and just like that woman searching for that coin, we need to be out searching for those people that are lost. Now look at verse 17. It says, But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. And I will rise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Was he a perishing son? Yes. He said it himself. He says, I perish with hunger. And even though no one came looking for him, he was hoping that to someone he must still have some kind of value as he sat in that pigsty thinking about home. He says, I'll just go back to my dad. I'll just go back and just ask him to let me be a servant in his house because I'm perishing. Now I'd ask you this question. The, the shepherd went looking for the sheep. The lady went looking for the coin. Nobody went looking for the son. Who should have went looking for the son? And many people would say, oh, the father. The father should have went looking for the son. But to correctly answer that question, you've got to understand what a parable is. See, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so when we read parables, we've got to read into the spiritual of that parable. And, and so the father would not go looking for the son. Why? Because in this parable, the father represents the father in heaven. The father in heaven is on his throne. He's not, uh, he came one time in the form of Jesus and he paid the penalty and paid the debt for our sins so that we wouldn't be lost. And now he's gone back to heaven. He's enthroned in heaven. And so therefore the father's not going to return again. So the father couldn't go looking for a son, just like the father in this parable was waiting for his son to be found. Well, then what about the good brother? You know, the good brother represents good Christians. We'll see later in the story that he was faithful to his dad, that he was always there and he was always faithful and he was always being what, the, uh, what his father wanted him to be. But the problem was that even though he represents us as believers, he didn't go looking for his lost brother. He didn't go looking. Now think about that. If people are lost in the world, the Father's not coming down to he from heaven to go looking for them. Remember what Jesus said right before He went to heaven? He says, you go. You go. The good brother should have went looking for the lost. We are the good brother. We're the ones that are faithful to the Father. We're the ones that live in the way we think the Father wants us to live. And all of the lost brothers and sisters of this world, we're the ones that should go looking for them. That's why Jesus said before He ascended into heaven, go into all the earth and preach the gospel. We're the ones. The, the good son should have went looking. But the good son didn't go looking. And the reason is in verse 25, it says, now his older son was in the field. He wasn't out looking for the brother because he was caught up in the things of his world. He was out working in his field. He was out making his money. He was out securing his future. And he was too busy to go looking for a worthless brother. And I wonder sometimes if that's what's wrong with our world today is that Christians are too busy to go looking for those that many of us look at them and go, they're worthless. 
They're lost. I go, Lord, but I don't have time. And so I wonder how many of us is represented by that good son that is so caught up in his world that he can never go looking for his brother that's lost. So let's talk about that good son. I told you that the sons are at the opposite ends of the story. So you got to drop down to that verse 25 to get to the good son. And here's what it says. It says, now his older brother was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Now let me ask you this. Was he a good son? Yes, he was a good son. And we'll see evidence of that as we continue to read. He was always with the father. He was faithful and true. He was a blessing to his dad. I mean, I want hardworking sons, don't you? And, and he was a good son. He was probably holding it all together because his dad was in grief over the brother. He was probably having to carry most of the load as his dad would look every day, hoping he'd see his son coming over that hill. He was a natural hard worker. He was always earning his own way out in the fields. He didn't waste anything like his brother did. Yes, he was a good son. And so we see him. He comes in from a hard day's work at the field. And what happens? There's something unusual going on. And he realizes that. He hears the sound of music and celebration. And he wonders to himself, what in the world could bring so much celebration? He also probably wondered, they're having a feast and they haven't came to the field and brought me in? And as he gets closer, he, he sees one of his servants and he asks him what's going on. And the news that the servant gives him just wrecks him. Wrecks him. He's so angry. Why would his father celebrate the return of one that's caused so much pain to their family? And he wouldn't go in. He just wouldn't go in. Then we see in verse 28, it says, but he was angry and he wouldn't go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. He's upset. Was he a prideful son? Yes. He was a prideful son. And the prideful son had long ago written off the worthless son. Notice how he refers to him. He says, the son of yours, instead of saying my brother. He's, he's disowned him. He couldn't see the truth of the moment because of his own self-righteousness. I'm so much better than him. He was so, he was just seeing red. And the celebration that he, the truth that he couldn't see is that the celebration was not for the life of a bum. It was for the return of a son. Amen. And he just couldn't see that. See, here's the problem. Prideful people reject pardoned people. Some people will look at somebody else and they'll go, I'm so much better than them. You know, sometimes somebody will live such a, a, a terrible life and, and their life will look so bad and, and then they'll, they'll come to Jesus and they'll get saved and God will start blessing them and sometimes He'll bless them more than somebody that's been faithful to the Lord all their adult life. And that person will say, I don't trust them. I don't believe them. It's that prideful son. It's that good son that, that he can't believe that somebody so bad could get a second chance. Prideful people reject pardon people. You know what? That self-centered pride, you know what it does? It cheats us out of the blessings of God that rightfully belong to us. 
You know what else it does? It, it separates us from the joy of the fellowship of our spiritual family. There's people today that, that are believers that probably used to even come here or whatever church they went to, they quit going to church because they got prideful about something and they just said, I'm never going back. That's what he's doing on that porch. He says, I'll never go in there. That's not right. I'm not going to go in there. Then we see in verse 31, it says, And he said to him, the father says to the son, Son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. So with the father saying that, did he become a reconciling son? We don't know. Because the story ends with him and the dad out on that porch. We don't know if he ever went inside or not. We don't know if he ever accepted his brother again or not. We just don't know if he ever reconciled or not. But the father gave him the right answer. So let's look at what the story is really about. The truth is not as much about the brothers being at odd as it is about the, uh, the father that's showing love for all his children. The loving father. And then first we see the father's love for the younger son. Look at verse 20. you got to back up. The father's in the middle. Verse 20 says, And he arose and came to his father. Talking about the, the bad son. He arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But before he could get the rest of the words out of his mouth, make me serve Before he could even say that, what happens? It says, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Listen, the father loved the younger son. He never quit loving him. And He represents our Father in Heaven who loves us all, good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't matter how bad someone is. The Father loves you. But you're lost. And therefore, there's no worth to you for Him. He wants every son, every daughter to come home. But not only did He love the younger son, He also loved the older son. Look again at verse 28. It says, but the older son was angry and would not go in. Therefore, look what happens. His father came out and pleaded with him. And not only that, it says that he said to him, son, you're always with me. You're right here, son. Always in my heart. Well, you're mine. He says that all that I have is yours. Everything is yours already. It was right that we should make Mary be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Look, the father's love is just as tender and just as gentle for that good brother as it was for the bad brother. Just as quickly as he ran up the road to, to meet his younger son, he ran out to the porch to meet his older son. He, he loved them both the same and he had love for them. And, and you know what he could have did? He could have said, well, if he wants to stay out of there, just let him miss out. But no, he couldn't do that because of his love for him. And so he goes out there to him and he pleads with him to understand what has just happened and to come in and join the celebration. The Father's love was enough for the younger son. The father's love was enough for the older son. The father's love, this father, is enough for all. It's enough for all. Look, the reception of the younger was not a rejection of the older. 
Although he felt that way. When sinners come to Christ, all that he has becomes theirs. But we're not any poorer because of it. He doesn't take away from us to give to them. We're not any poor. We're nonetheless, all that He has already belongs to us. Let's open the doors wide and welcome everybody in to get the same blessings we already have. I mean, think about this. Consider the sunshine. God's creation. You and I walk in it every day. We can get all that we need. We can get so much of it like I did the other week. I got sunburned. I got more than I need. But you know what? I can get all the sunshine I need. Can I tell you something? There's still enough for everybody else with plenty left over. Yes. We, can't, we can't use up the blessings of God. If he's going to give you His blessings. He's going to give others His blessings. Everybody is blessed. Everybody gets the blessings of God. Nobody is cheated because more come into this house. Because more come into the body of Christ. Because more are no longer lost. And they get the, they get the robe. And they get the ring. And they get the fatted calf. And, and we might look back and go, why is God blessing them so much? But we're... We're being too quick to forget our own blessings. I know I was a prodigal son, and when I finally came home, I'm going to tell you, he put a ring on me, put a robe on me, he put the he put his salvation on me. And nobody suffered because of that. But man, I sure was blessed to be welcomed home as a beloved son. I don't know in this picture how you see yourself. Do you see yourself as the good son? Or do you see yourself as the bad son? For some people, their life is, is ruined and it's wasted. Like the bad son. They're making choices that, that is hurting them. And, and you know, maybe you're here today and you feel like that you're just in a bad place in your life. And you, you kind of relate to that bad son. Wasted his substance on prodigal living. But you know what? That bad son was never but one step away. Just one step away. He's sitting in that pig pen. He is just one step away from coming to the Father. And in that pig pen, he decided to get up and take that step and come back home to his Father. And no matter how bad your life is today, you're one step away from coming to the Father and getting the ring and getting the robe and getting the fatted calf and getting all the blessings that He can afford you. You're just one, you just got to step out and you've got to come. What a shame it'd be to live such a bad life, deserving of hell, and to miss out on the open arms of the Father inviting you to a new life in Christ. Your life can change forever. John 6, 37, Jesus says this. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one that comes to me, I will by no means cast out. One step away and he will not cast you out. He will receive you and he will fill your life with joy and blessings. But also, you might feel like you're the good son today. You're doing everything right, but still life doesn't feel right. You're doing everything right, but it just seems like something's still wrong, and, and you just don't know what to do about that. You know that good son, he knew he could hear a celebration. He knew something was going on. He knew that other people had something he didn't have. Other people was experiencing something with the Father that, that He just wasn't experiencing it. And maybe you come in here week in and week out and you go, you know what? I see this person and they just seem to be so close to God. And I see that person, they seem to be walking with God. I just can't seem to get there. And you feel like you're the one out on the porch looking in. But that good son, just like the bad son, that older brother, just like the younger brother, was just one step away. All the blessings of the Father was right inside that door. And all He had to do was take one step and go in. His Father had invited Him. And listen, you maybe you're a believer. Maybe you've been a believer for a long time, but yet you just don't feel that closeness. 
Well, maybe you need to take a step closer. Maybe you need to get off the porch and get into the room where everything is happening, where everything is going on. And, and the Father says, all that I have is yours to enjoy. Stop standing out there on that porch. All the riches of the Father just one step away. What a shame it'd be to live a good life, to be such a good son or daughter, but miss out on the blessings of the Father because of selfishness, because of pride. And here's what I'm saying to you is that there may be somebody here today and, and you've known God's already been tugging to your heart. Maybe for weeks now, God's been tugging to your heart to get your heart right with Him to come off of the porch and get into the, into the party, so to speak. And, and through pride, it's, it's hard to just release the things of the world. He was caught up in His things. He was out in His field. He was doing His thing. But the Father was saying, stop all that, son, and come into where the blessings are. Listen, I don't know where you're at with the Lord today, but I know this. is that we're all one step away to be at where He wants us to be. What is that step you need to take today? Maybe you need to come forward this morning so that you can experience all that salvation has to offer. Maybe you need to step out this morning and rededicate your life to the Lord. Listen, that, that good son, that older brother, he needed to rededicate his life to his family, to his dad, to his brother. He was at odds with them. He needed to get some things right. And I invite you today to come and get things right. Come to this altar. Bow before the Lord. Pour out your heart. You might say, well, I don't even know how to start praying. Come and let's talk about it and I'll pray with you. Whatever you stand in need of, today is the day. You're just one step.